wild. And it's yielded this just massive amount of support in both virtual terms and real terms. It's not been the case inside Russia, which is arguably now the most important part of the information battlefield, because that's what's going to determine how the Putin regime responds next. Do they think they can stay in this fight um, without risk to his own regime, or do they have to figure a way out of it? Katerina, how are Ukrainians trying to counteract this, this lack of information in Russia? Well, I think Ukrainians primarily are focusing their communication outwards to the rest of the world. And uh, we've seen an enormous uptick of activity on Twitter, for example. Uh, most Ukrainians are uh, using Facebook much more actively than Twitter, but we've seen a lot more migration of Ukrainian thought leaders and other communicators to Twitter uh, to tell Ukraine's story, including journalists. Um, so some of that is that uh, the, the Ukrainians just happen to be where uh, things happen with phones and they spread the videos of what they see. Uh, we, we see that kind of communication not only from the military that is there in the aftermath of unspeakable atrocities uh, to mandane looting when Russian soldiers are fulfilling orders from their spouses and their, their phone calls are intercepted and then spread on social media. Uh, but then there's also just more organic activity, uh, unscripted moments uh, of Ukrainians essentially resisting the occupation. Uh, the whole world now knows that a sunflower is a national flower of Ukraine because a Ukrainian woman in the early days of this war uh, came up to a Russian occupation soldier in eastern Ukraine and then told him to put sunflower seeds in his pockets uh, so that when he uh, dies in Ukraine, sunflowers will grow from his grave. That is an instantly memeable uh, activity, and that has now gone viral. Uh, the same can be said for numerous videos of farmers throwing disabled Russian tanks with tractors. Uh, these kinds of moments are happening uh, in the reality of war, and, and phone cameras uh, connected to the Internet just happen to be there, uh, and Ukrainians are uh, using it to their advantage in the same way that the cameras are there to witness the aftermaths of Russia's atrocities in Bucha, Irpin, and in Mariupol. So, so that's the Ukrainian effort to to share their story to the rest of the world. But are there also efforts to try to get information into Russia? There's been some reports of uh, really creative things that Ukrainians and people around the world are trying to do. For example, uh, using the uh, comment sections and review sections for Russian restaurants uh, on some of their popular sites to uh, spread the word about what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Uh, it remains to be seen how effective that is. I, you know, the, the those in Russia who have been who have been reading their news from the internet for long periods of time are much more aware of what's happening uh, than those that get their news from television. Uh, a lot more of them are migrating to Telegram, for example, is one of the platforms that's grown in popularity using uh, VPNs, and uh, Ukrainians are essentially trying to engage them where they. Can. We got this email from Mike who says, isn't the U.S. capable of disrupting critical infrastructure in Russia? Are we doing it? Dustin, you, you alluded to this earlier in the conversation, but how would you respond to Mike? I would say that, uh, you know, my conversations with U.S. officials, um, they always repeatedly say that you know, we have the best of the best cyber capabilities in the U.S. government um, in terms of espionage and also
We're just delayed just I, a few I, I, minutes. I'm, we'll I'm get started, really but I guarantee. The Roanoke City Council recess session uh, today to fill the Roanoke City School Board interviews and discussions and interview the candidates to fill the, and also to introduce the candidate to fill the term of former council member Robert Jeffries. This morning we're gonna have our school board interviews and I'm gonna ask that clerk if she would please call the roll. Mr. Cobb. Here. Ms. Moon Reynolds. Here. Ms. Sanchez Jones. Here. Vice Mayor White Boyd. Here. Mr. Best Pitch. Here. And Mayor Lee. Here. And the quorum is present. I want to welcome everybody and uh, our viewers this morning. Uh, this meeting will be televised live and replayed on RVTV Channel 3 on Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. and video stream through Facebook Live at facebook.com slash VA. period. Council meetings are offered with closed captioning for the deaf or hard of hearing. 
The purpose of this meeting is for City Council to conduct four interviews to select two candidates to serve as Roanoke City School Board trustees for three for three year for three year term, excuse me, of office. Each commencing July the first, twenty twenty two. And there'll be three interviews for trustees of Roanoke City School Board and the candidates are Mary Alpha Pale, Mary's been here, you were first up. Uh, then Ryan Bell, Kathy Cohen, and Joyce W. Watkins. And uh, we appreciate each of them applying. And each interview will last for approximately 30 minutes and will entail the purpose, and the candidates will entail the purpose for their willingness to serve on the school board and answer questions from the council. And once the interviews have been completed, the applicant may disconnect since no official action will be taken today. All right, I want to just to counsel. Uh, normally, each one of us will have questions, but if there is a follow up or something that said that we may want to know, we can go ahead on, and that, and that doesn't disrupt your turn, but you want to follow up on something that's said. So please feel free to do that. All right, uh, we're ready to begin, and I'm going to ask Mary F. Appel if she would come forward. Mary, thank you for stepping forward and wanting to be uh, a member of our school board. Uh, we always appreciate citizens who are willing to, to do that. Uh, let me say the interviews, each one of us will have a question. And, uh, but in the beginning, we're going to give you a couple of minutes just to tell us who you are, or sort of an introductory statement, uh, two minutes. <clears throat> and then at the conclusion, you can share with us anything that maybe our questions didn't bring out that you'd like for us to know. So again, welcome. Thank you. All right, I'll start off, well, I'm sorry. Introductions. Go ahead and introduce yourself to us. Um, my name is Mary Apel, but I go by Franny. Um, my middle name is Francis, so um, you can please refer to me as that if you would like. Um, and I appreciate the time um, for all of you to have me here today. I'm very honored that I was considered for the interview portion. Um, is this when I should go ahead and give a statement? Take a couple minutes. Okay. Um, so I feel that um, I am uniquely qualified for this position for three aspects. One, I have been an educator since 2003 when I joined Teach for America and taught on the south side of Chicago. Um, I actually taught three years, even though it's a two-year placement, and that's when I first got into education, and I was a high school math teacher there. Um, I also coached, and I've been coaching the entirety of my teaching career. Um, my children are young, and so that's the second aspect that I think I bring to being a school board member. My son is seven, and he's a second grader in Roanoke City Public Schools, and my daughter will be entering the public schools here um, in the fall of 2022. Um, my sister's family also recently moved here, and both of their children are also Roanoke City um, school attendees. So that's the second aspect, both the teacher-focused and parent-focused aspects of being a school board member and um, bringing that perspective. I also have done a lot of work within the community um, as a member of uh, the Junior League of Roanoke Valley um, with multiple hundreds of hours of volunteer service over the last five years, and I'm slated to be president-elect next year. Um, so I've worked with a lot of community organizations. Uh, Mr. Cobb has actually spoken at one of our meetings, and so I feel very connected and invested in the community of Roanoke, and I feel like I understand different um, issues that our population um, are facing. So um, those are the three things that I think qualify me is my community investment, <coughs> my role as a parent of students in this system, and my extensive experience as an educator and as a coach. Um, I also have taught 
in a lot of school, different schools. I started out teaching in an urban district in Chicago Public Schools proper in a school of about 500 to 1,000 students that was 95% free and reduced lunch and um, a very high needs population. Then I moved to North Carolina where I taught in rural Elkin, North Carolina for three years in a small school with a graduating class of about 80. And it was a very socioeconomically diverse school with very high expectations. And I was told by the assistant principal on my interview that they expected no child to fall through the cracks. Um, then I taught in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, which is an urban school district. And I taught at a school very analogous to Patrick Henry. So I taught there for six years. It was about 2,000 students. And we had an arts magnet program. We also had visually impaired and hearing impaired students at our school. We had a large refugee population at our school. And I taught. Um, both everything from remedial classes all the way up to AP calculus. And then when we moved here, um, I ended up teaching at Roanoke Catholic for a number of years. And that was my first um, experience with teaching in the private schools. So I've done a lot with various school systems. I've done everything from being a teacher mentor to leading professional development to leading um, de uh, professional development curriculum wide or um, district wide in Winston Salem or school wide in Elkin City. I've done things, I've experienced professional development for um, ESL populations, specifically PSYOP, if you've ever heard of that, it's sheltered instruction observation protocol, but um, specifically it's focused towards ESL students or ELL students, um, but basically the tenets of those different um, strategies apply to all students because really, if you think about it, teaching curriculum is like teaching another language. If you've ever taken a biology course or tried to help somebody with it 20 years after the fact, you know that you have to know the vocabulary and be fluent before you can even start to master the material. So um, I have a lot, a wide um, array of experience within schools. And I feel like I could really help with um, making sure that we are teacher-centric and student-centric within Roanoke City. And I think also my perspective as a teacher will help with retention and recruitment. All right, thank you. All right, my first question is centered around security. It's, it appears as though guns, where well, guns are very prevalent in our communities in this city. Uh, and it seems like guns are making an appearance uh, in schools again. There have been shootings all around around the Commonwealth on that. What is your thoughts on how do we keep guns out of schools as a school board member? Well, I know that some people's initial reaction would be something like metal detectors. And the first school I ever taught in had metal detectors, and we had police officers with their own office in the school that I taught at. Um, the next school I taught at, students thought it was weird when I would have my classroom door locked. So um, I believe that guns are more of a, um, they are the end result of things that are community based. And I think it needs to be a community based integrated approach between families, you know, um, the government and the schools. Um, I think anything that we do, um, I'm a firm believer in SMART goals. This is something I taught when I was, you know, establishing, you know, lesson plans and annual plans for my classroom, that any goals we set should be SMART. So that's an acronym for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. So if we say we want our schools to be more safe, what does that actually mean? And can we check that box off with whatever initiatives we put in place? Are they research-based? Um, do they make common sense? Are they pragmatic and logistical, logistically feasible? So we could say metal detectors may be one thing that can help. Um, are they logistically feasible if a school has 15 entrances and exits? You know. Um, I've been to schools, different parks, or schools I've taught in where you may have one metal detector for one entrance, but how do you logistically watch out for the other 16 doors that all open out during the school day? So is that something that makes us feel safe or actually makes our students safer? Um, and what does it look like on the ground? 
what will it look like day to day to actually ensure the safety of our students so um, I am not a security expert I would expect to help get information and do research from that and then use the information we're presented and have a pragmatic realistic approach to is this helping is this a reaction to a problem or is it helping solve a problem or where are we falling on that spectrum okay thank you I will go to my left and start with Ms. Moon Reynolds for the next question. Hi, how are you? Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is twofold, actually. What do you perceive to be the major weaknesses and major strengths of the Roanoke City School System? And also, what is your assessment of the school superintendent? Um, so with regards to the superintendent, I know she's relatively new, and she came in and took, you know, had to take on COVID at the beginning. So um, I think she's done a good job. And specifically, I really like the strategic plan that was approved back in February. Um, I think it is very good for the system, for the students, and for the teachers, and for the community. Um, I love what she said about that she believes that our students, that we have to help our students connect the dots between their educational success and their life, the life they envision for themselves. So, um, and I think the focus on um, getting the Rotec Center, um, you know, implemented is great. Um, with respect to strengths and weaknesses, I think um, access is always an issue. Um, I think COVID really highlighted access to technology and internet when in-person instruction um, wasn't available um, and that was across the board not just in the city um, so I think that ensuring access for our students um, is one of the most important things we can do and again with respect to a pragmatic approach what does it look like to make sure that students can access the materials that they need so um, how do we logistically implement things so knowing that we have a wide range of haves and have nots within the city and what do you see as the strengths the strengths oh um are you still with the weaknesses oh um, i had forgotten about that okay, part of the right. the question so i i do really think that um the city has a very good um, strategic plan moving forward and I love the attention to um, the vocational classes and um, I really um, approve trying to increase the number of dual enrollment in AP classes I've started AP math programs at multiple schools that I've been at and focusing on literacy um, we all know that literacy and education are some of the greatest indicators for poverty or socioeconomic um, success so putting those things down on paper and holding yourself accountable to those things I think are are excellent and I think there's a good plan um, that that has been approved in February all right thank you all right next question we'll go to council member Vivian Sanchez Jones good morning good morning and um, my question is going to have three parts so describe your knowledge of the city's cultural and linguistic diversity and discuss the importance of the following providing services for students who are developing proficiency in English offering opportunities for students to learn a foreign language and ensuring that students from all neighborhoods have an equitable access to high quality instruction and programs Um, so I know that our city has a growing Latino population um, and um, Spanish speaking population I know we also have had some refugees um, due to um, an influx of refugees due to some worldwide issues that we've been facing in the last few years so um, I am not very knowledgeable about what services currently are offered in our schools um, with regards to meeting those students where they are I do know that it is our job to meet every student where they are and to help them progress to what the standards are now um, I do believe that um, as I mentioned before that all education is like teaching a foreign language to our students and that 
um, strategies that our teachers can implement that are good for ELL learners are as equally good for all of our learners in our schools. So sound instruction is going to be a good support for all of our students. And all of our students have gaps that we need to close due to COVID. Um, I do believe in, um, there's schools that I've taught in in the past where we had um, English for or Spanish for native speakers, for example, because just because you may be fluent in a language does not mean that you are literate in those languages. So literacy and what that means, understanding the language, understanding the vocabulary, how to write, how to read, those things are just as important as just the speaking aspect of it. I do think we'll need to make sure that we have ways for parents of English language learners to have access to make sure that they know how to advocate for their students if there's a language barrier, how we make sure to uh, um, address that. Um, I think foreign language in general is wonderful to make sure that it's um, programs that our students have access to and the earlier the better. So um, because we know that smaller, younger kids have minds that are like sponges and they can really grasp languages earlier on. So the earlier we can have foreign language options available for students, I think it's excellent. But if we really want our students to be able to compete in a global world, they need to be familiar with other cultures, which includes languages. So um, I think what, what offerings we can make available are, is, would be wonderful. Um, and as far as equity and access, I think I've approached that, um, addressed that a little bit, but I think sound quality education is the great equalizer. And so making sure that our students have teachers who are qualified and support systems in place to make sure that they are able to succeed, equity will come by providing that equal E excellent education opportunity for all of them. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll start with the Vice Mayor Trish White Boy. Good morning. Morning. Um, I I just have uh, one thing I wanted to ask. I didn't write it down. Um, the, you said you wanted to do the smart approach. What was the A and R? Uh, what did that? Yes, ma'am. Um, so S is specific. M is measurable. So how do you know that you have achieved it? A is that it's achievable. So you could say world peace, but is it an actually achievable right. goal? R is relevant and T is time bound. Oh, okay, yeah, I did. Okay. And um, my question is um, for you to identify two essential objectives that you hope to accomplish as a school board trustee. Um, I would like to realize the potential of the Rotec Center. Um, I think um, our country has gotten very college focused and we've, I think that we need to be good stewards of our students and realize that there are a myriad of ways that people can be fulfilled in their um, adult lives and can contribute to society. And I think with the um, expansion of Carillion, the Rotec Center would give us an excellent opportunity to realize um, some courses in health sciences, not just, um, you know, sometimes I think people maybe think about um, auto body or things where you're working with your hands, but it goes well beyond that. Um, when I taught in North Carolina, the, we had programs in place where students would walk out of, they would cross the line at graduation and they would have an associates or a CNA when they left. So they would have the ability to work the minute they stepped off the podium and they could work in a field that they already had trained in. So I really think that realizing what the Rotec Center can mean about rem um, removing barriers for our students to be successful in their careers. Um, we, there's a lot that we can do with that. So um, I think helping people become entrepreneurs, you can have business classes there. there there's so much you can do with that, um, with those offerings. Um, I also really look forward to trying to implement strong 
um, AP and dual enrollment classes, those higher level classes for our students. Um, because A, it will make sure that we're hitting a certain um, expectation of rigor. Um, but B, that is a way that our students can walk out the door when they graduate with college credits. Um, just same idea, you know, that, that cost them significantly less money. So if you can go into college with 30 college credits, you're saving a full years of tuition and um, you had a much more favorable environment. Uh, as I tell my AP Calculus students, you're in a classroom of 20 to 25 with me. You go take calculus in college, that's math 101, and you're in a lecture hall with 300. So the attention they can get um, and the benefits they can reap from that, um, from having the ability to not have finances get in the way of them being exposed to college level curriculum, um, I really look forward to helping implement that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Council Member Joe Cobb. Good morning, Franny. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're both parents of kids in Roanoke City Public Schools, and during the pandemic, we experienced some realities that maybe we didn't anticipate experiencing uh, with gratitude to the, the schools. Um, but my question is kind of twofold. During the COVID-19 pandemic, what gaps in our educational system did you see emerge? And how would you work with administration to address those gaps in the coming years? Um, so, um, first, attendance, attendance significantly lagged. Um, I actually was taught during the first three months of the pandemic. So I was still teaching and did the whole conversion to virtual. I was lucky enough to have high school students who could deal with that much better than our younger elementary students. So um, um, attendance and being present just means they, our students just didn't get 100% of the curriculum. And then when we went into the 2020-2021 school year and our students were virtual and then hybrid, there was no way that we could realistically say that our students were going to be getting 100% of that curriculum either. So I think what we're really looking at is curricular gaps that you may have only, teachers may have only been able to accomplish 50% or 70% of what was outlined on the standards of learning for the state. And that is reasonably so. You know, um, research best practices do not say that our students, especially our young students, who need to be touching things and interacting with each other and moving around the classroom, that they could learn as well from in front of a screen. I, I would imagine that literacy significantly um, lagged do, for our younger students. I also think that. Um, so I help volunteer at my, my daughter's school, and recently they've been able to take off masks in those classrooms there, but I know, um, and that's a two to six year olds go to her school, New Vista Montessori School, but um, the inability for our small children to be able to hear the pronunciation of letters and to be able to see how words are formed, just how those other physical aspects of reading and literacy, how that will impact our young students as they try to move forward and close those gaps. I think those will be um, interesting things to watch out for and to kind of try to keep in mind for our teachers and our students as we move forward and try to close those gaps. Um, how to address them. Um, so it's, as I've been thinking about um, coming into this interview, I found it interesting that I started my teaching career doing Teach for America, and the tenet of Teach for America is a high quality education for all. And we were specifically placed in schools that are high needs and underperforming schools. And our goals were, like the elementary teachers had a goal of one and a half grades of literacy growth for all of their students. We had, we knew that we were entering an environment where we had to make up for gaps and closing the achievement gap. And here we are, basically 20 years later, and everyone has an achievement gap because of COVID. It is 
unavoidable. And so I was thinking back on how I think that helps me to be to give good perspective as a member of the board that really the ideas of making sure that our teachers have good sound professional development to help them with the expectation that we're asking them to teach more than a year's worth curriculum in a year to help catch our kids up and what does that look like it looks like spiraling content so kids will see um, in each unit what they should have learned the year before and the unit before so they see it again and again and it gives them the opportunity to master those objectives that they maybe didn't get or didn't fully master along the way it means scaffolding so making sure that they have the support in the classroom so that they are prepared to learn if they don't have the foundations how do we give them that those foundations so scaffolding that's a an education or differentiating how do we help how do I have a classroom where I have kids at the high level and kids at the low level for whatever reasons how do I help move them all forward um, as one teacher in a classroom or one teacher with an A does that look like multiple activities does that look like heterogeneous grouping so you have higher students having to teach to young, uh, or higher students helping with the lower students does that mean homogeneous grouping where you let them all progress as fast as they can so you can hit kids where they are at their levels so um, I think there's a lot of educational techniques as long as our teachers are fully prepared for that that they can make gains um, so I think through good teacher um, professional development also probably small class sizes would smaller class sizes would help and I did notice that was in the strategic plan as well um, so and I, I am a fan personally of smaller class sizes and how much reach you can have with that Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilman Bespich. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Franny, it's good, nice to meet you. Thanks Likewise. for being here with us. My question is about the role and relationship that a trustee should develop and maintain with the members of city council. How do you see the role of the trustees and the uh, relationship with city council? Um. Well, if we are appointed by you, then we are held accountable by you. So, um, w and we should be held accountable to the city council by what you approve both in the capital um, improvement plan and the strategic plan and what we do for our, for our students. So it was really about what we're, that we do what we say we're going to do and that we follow through and that we are open and transparent and when you come to us with questions we should have good reasons behind what we are or are not doing and so um, I think it should be a collegial relationship and an open and collaborative one so because you all are voted for by the constituents which the school board is then entrusted to serve so the voters are using you all to communicate what they want for their school system along with other things. Thank you. Mary, could I ask you a question to follow up Mr. Best Pitcher's question? In the school districts where you worked, yes, sir. were the board members appointed or elected? Um, you know, I'm not sure. This is definitely um, where I've taught before. I didn't have children yet, so this is definitely the most uh, this is a, has been a natural evolution for me personally mm -hmm. to think about being involved in a school board if that makes sense okay. so my investment previously would have been school-wide or district-wide based on you know what roles I had within the school or the district so I um, mean I focused a lot more on say the extracurriculars and different programs within the schools I was I was at you know with respect to coaching or peer tutoring programs or things like that so I, I am not certain how they ran those boards but. okay thank you mm -hmm. that concludes our questions now you have the closing part of it do you have a couple of minutes to to uh, share with us some things that you want to bring out or ask any questions that you may have Um, I just I think I wanted to mention that um, I think that I would be very helpful with respect to teacher retention and teacher recruitment because of the perspective I can give as a teacher um, that I know our teachers want to teach 
and they want to feel supported in being able to do that, especially with everything that we know that they're facing trying to make up for the COVID years. Um, I also think that I have a lot of background, not just in education and being a parent and in the community. I also served on a board um, of my daughter's school during COVID and had to deal with making decisions about staff, school closing, school opening, how do we deal with safety, how do we retain our staff when things are hard, how do we make sure that our students are still learning. That uh, The school my daughter and my son went there when he was younger it was a Montessori school, so everything is hands-on. How do we do those things safely? What does it look like? So I, I dealt with on a much smaller scale making those kinds of decisions. How do we deal financially? What can we, what, what can we do with the monies we have or don't have or don't anticipate um, having? So um, I also think that I am very objective and pragmatic, and I want to know what does it look like when it's boots on the ground? Um, what does this look like for our students? What does this look like for our teachers? What does this look like for our parents day to day and then over the course of the whole year. I also think that I'm very good at taking the big picture and chunking it down to saying, okay, we have a six year plan. What does that look like in one year? So what does that look like in one quarter? And how do we make sure that we're not behind, you know, in year three for year six? Um, so, and I think I'm very good at being able to hear the information and see multiple perspectives and keep in mind that we are here for our students um, and what's best for them. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting you this morning and uh, we'll, we'll be back in touch with you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next candidate is Ryan Bell. Does anybody need to take a break before we go further? Is Mr. Bell out there? I think so. Like yes, there he is. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Good Bell. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to this interview, and you know we're always pleased to see citizens wanting to step forward and and be a part of the governing bodies of this city. Uh, what we have this morning is each council member will have a question, and we'll ask you uh, that question. Uh, but in the beginning, we ask each candidate to take two minutes to introduce themselves to us to tell us something about you and then we'll have the question and at the conclusion uh, we will ask you to close on anything that you want to or that the interview did not bring out that you want us to know or and ask any questions that you have so uh, with that I'm going to give you your two minutes introduction. Sounds good. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I try to be two minutes. My kids just told me last night that I'm a little long-winded, right? So I try to keep it to two minutes. But uh, my name is Ryan Bell. Uh, I am a native of Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, went to William Ruffner Middle School. Graduated from William Fleming High School. Um, I am a double HBCU graduate with degrees from Virginia Union University and Virginia State University. 
Um, my background is in education, even though I got a, a degree in business at Virginia Union, uh, followed in my father's footsteps uh, into the field of education. Um, was a special ed teacher's assistant for a short period of time in York County, Virginia, at Tab High School. Uh, left there and went to Richmond, uh, back to Richmond where I attended college and became a special education teacher in Richmond Public Schools. Um, I did uh, different types of special education in Richmond, inclusion, um, pull out, push in, and then I also taught uh, the adaptive classroom, uh, which had a range of beautifully gifted students from the areas of Down syndrome, opposition defined, different things of that nature, right? Um, I then left Richmond and came back home to Roanoke uh, and worked at the health department uh, with a program called the Virginia Family and Fatherhood Initiative where we focused a lot on teen and young adult pregnancy prevention and intervention um, and education around the areas of finance, responsible parenting, um, educational attainment, different things of that nature. Um, and then I transitioned over to Roanoke City Public Schools and uh, had the great opportunity to uh, be the first coordinator of family and community engagement for Roanoke City Public Schools. Um, and then being a parent, I have a daughter who doesn't live here in the city of Roanoke. Uh, I transitioned back to the area of Richmond, Virginia uh, and worked for Richmond Public Schools again uh, in the space of early childhood education and school readiness. And I was the uh, director for family and community engagement for the early childhood department. Um, where we had a range, where I had a range of responsibilities from uh, dealing with enrollment, uh, dealing with increased access for parents in the space of early childhood education, and how we used the uh, resources from the community to push in and pull into the schools. Um, but true to Roanoke form, I couldn't stay away from Roanoke long, too long at all, right? I spent a lot of time here even once I had left, and so I eventually ended up transitioning back here to Roanoke yet again. Um, this time to stay. I brought the whole family with me here this time, right? Um, and so I've been back in Roanoke for a little under a year now, uh, currently working over at the United Way Roanoke Valley uh, as the care resource coordinator uh, with a few responsibilities there around vaccine education um, and promotion within uh, the Franklin County area and then a lot of work with our community health worker program to move people um, towards self-sustainability. And then I oversee a new initiative with the United Way Roanoke Valley called the Black Father Family Initiative. Um, I am an oldest brother of two. I am a son, a son of uh, Catherine Bell and the late Carlton Bell, who uh, is an educator himself, used to be principal at uh, Hurt Park Elementary School. Uh, and I am a father of four. Um, and uh, I have three, two nine-year-olds, a six-year-old, and I have no clue in the world why we did this, but we started over again, and now I have a seventh-month-old at home as well. Um, and so that is a, a little bit about myself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have the first question. Okay. Uh, it deals with security. And we're going to have Wednesday a major summit in the city on gun violence. And uh, over the last several months, it appears as though guns have reappeared in our schools, uh, not only here in Roanoke, but around the Commonwealth. There have been issues. And so my question is when parents come and ask, how would you, as a school board member, prevent guns from coming into schools, or what ideas or thoughts do you have regarding that? Absolutely. So if a parent approached me uh, to talk about the gun violence uh, challenges that we may have or guns presenting themselves in our schools here recently, the first thing I would do with that parent is to reassure them that it is not, this is not just a Ronald problem, right? Um, to reassure them that this is a problem um, or a challenge that we see across our nation. And so it's not something that is unique to the, to, to the Roanoke Valley. Um, and hopefully in doing that, uh, providing them some data, some research, different things of that nature to ensure a, a level of comfortability um, for them in that respect, right? Um, and then as far as ideas and how we address these particular issues um, or we address these concerns and these challenges, I think the first, uh, the first thing that we have to do, we have this, this, this saying that your, your child's first educator is the parent, right? And so I think we have to really uh, begin to intentionally focus our efforts in that respect and offer some, op some educational opportunities for parents in regards um, to uh, safe and responsible gun ownership, right? And again, not saying that you can't own a gun. It's your right to own a gun, right? But how do we ensure that those guns that we own are not ending up in the hands of our children and then ending up in our schools, right? 
um, being being a, this idea of the village, right? Uh, being uh, individuals within our schools who are responsible um, for the children within our schools and how we ensure that when our children are um, coming into our schools that they have the proper um, ways and mechanisms to enter our schools to ensure that guns are not making their ways into our, into our schools, right? Um, and then education with our students, I think is very uh, important, is vitally important um, that we educate our students on the uh, finality that guns produce, right, um, in regards to, to life, right? Um, helping them to understand and, and, and value uh, the, the individual student who is with them as well, right? And I think we have to do that sooner rather than later. Um, I think a lot, a lot of times uh, interventions that we put in place um, or uh, 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 strategies that we develop, right, um, a lot of times those strategies are in, in put in place um, or come at a point in time where it may be a little too late, right? And so we have to go in a little earlier, right? Even in the space of, I, I, my background is in early childhood education, right? Even in the space of early childhood education, we could begin to implement some of those social emotional learning and those skills around valuing human life and really begin to uh, move our students along the path of enlight enlightening them educationally around what guns cause and what guns could produce, right? Now, of course, there are extreme measures um, that can be put in place. I don't believe that Roanoke City has uh, reached that place yet where we're a city that needs uh, metal detectors before you walk into a school or we need resource officers who are um, standing at the, uh, the school building doors when you first come in to pat students down. I've seen that in districts that I've been in before, right? Um, I, I don't think that Roanoke City has reached that point yet, right? Uh, but we have to ensure that we're providing these educational opportunities so that we never reach that point. And so I think if a parent approached me, um, again, the first thing that I would do with a parent in particular is to offer them a level of comfort, comfort and comfortability that even though you see this problem, um, it's not a problem that is happening in majority of our schools, right? It's, it's in a minority few of our schools. And even within the schools that it's presented itself, it doesn't happen each and every day within that particular school building. So I think the first thing that I would do is to begin to offer them a level of comfortability around their child, even though these situations may happen here and there, that the school is still one of the safest places for them to be. All right, thank you. I'm going to go to my right this time and ask the vice mayor, uh, Trish Wright board to ask the next question. Morning, Mr. Bale. Good how are morning. you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, my question um, is, is relatively simple, I think, um, and that is for you to identify two essential objectives that you hope to accomplish as a school board trustee. Yes, to absolutely. Great question. Um, so my background is in family and community engagement. So first and foremost, um, I think that Roanoke City Public Schools uh, has done a great job in the area of family and community engagement. Um, but it's one particular area that I do think uh, could use some more intentional attention, right, to that particular area. So the first objective um, that, that I, when I came, when I come on as a trustee that I would like to accomplish would be in the area of family and community engagement, right? And not just family and community engagement from the standpoint of increasing the amount of, the amount of parents who are involved within the public school system, but looking at family and community engagement from a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? How can we begin to uh, impact families generationally through what our school system can provide, right? Um, for example, I've seen school districts across the nation that have uh, working relationships with colleges and universities that offer free full rise to four-year institutions, right? Um, and that in and of itself reduces a financial burden that students may have generationally, right? How do we uh, use the, um, uh, the area of family and community engagement to increase a, access to adult education, um, to ensure that our students uh, have the opportunity and their parents have the opportunity to increase the access of their education, right? Um, I, I believe there's a program uh, that just recently started at Lucy Addison Middle School um, in partnership with the YMCA called the Beacons Project or the Beacons Initiative, right? And to my understanding, one of the aims of the Beacons, Beacons Initiative is to increase the amount of opportunities for parents, whether that be nursing classes, whether that be finance classes, whether that be electrical classes, whatever the case may be, using the school, using the school as a tool to move families forward, right? So that would be my first objective as a trustee is to increase the amount of access um, that, that our schools have to our families, right? And then the second objective uh, uh, would be, again, in the space of, to uh, Mayor Lee's first question around safety, and, and not just 
um, with guns, for example, right? Uh, but safety in general, right? How do we, as a school system, uh, do our part or increase our efforts around our part to ensure that our students feel that they are growing up in safe, happy, healthy neighborhoods, safe, happy, healthy households, and safe, happy, healthy communities, right? Uh, while I was uh, working in family and community engagement, I'll give you a quick story um, to, to uh, undergird what I'm talking about here. Uh, we were um, in the process of considering implementing a home visiting program, right? And so I uh, approached a few students within the school that I was working at to ask, uh, would they be interested in participating in the home visiting uh, project that we were getting ready to launch? And one of the young ladies that I approached uh, enthusiastically and emphatically said, no, right? She uh, um, did not want us to visit her at her home, right? Um, and so initially I was a little taken aback as to why that may be. And I decided to have some additional conversations with her. And she pulled me to the side and she said, hey, Mr. Bell, it's not that I don't want you to come visit me at my home. She said, I don't know if you would be safe if you did, right? And so I think that an another objective of mine would be to ensure that we as school board trustees, that we as the school system of Roanoke, that we as the city of Roanoke, right, the citizens, local government, whatever the case may be, are ensuring that we have increased access to family and community engagement and that we are using our positions within the school system, within the city government to ensure that we are um, uh, helping our students and families feel like the neighborhoods, communities, and households they grow up in are safe, happy, and healthy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Councilor Joe Good afternoon, Mr. Bell. Good afternoon. Uh, we're emerging from a pandemic and that has really changed uh, our lives over the last couple of years. And as, as parents, we, we see that firsthand with our children. Um, identify for me a gap um, that you have seen in our educational system through the pandemic and how you would work with school administration to address that gap? Yeah, so uh, I, the pandemic um, was tough on everyone, right? Uh, and really um, highlighted some particular areas uh, within school systems, again, across the nation, um, areas of improvement uh, that, that, that we see, areas of improvement that we can begin to build upon, right? Um, and so again, I, I speak a lot because my background was in the area of family and community engagement, but I speak a lot about how the school system um, can uh, partner with families to ensure the overall success um, of students. And so one of the gaps that I saw throughout the pandemic um, was students, the, the school system did a great job in ensuring that students had access to technology, right? That students had access to the ability to be able to uh, receive the education via laptops, via helping out with internet connection, different things of that nature, right? And I think they did the best job that a school system could do in the middle of a pandemic, right? The gap that I saw, though, when I would take these drives through neighborhoods, right, was the ability or the, the, the capacity for parents to do both, right? The capacity for parents to, to have students who were at home and who needed some uh, additional love and attention to ensure that they focused during that time of receiving their education and having to weigh that with the responsibility of still having to report to work each and every day, right? And so I think one of the gaps, uh, one of the gaps that, that, that was highlighted or identified within the pandemic, again, is this concept of how do we ensure as a school system, how do we ensure as a city that we are putting families in a position that they no longer have to make those types of difficult decisions, right? How are we ensuring that we're putting our families in a position to where they have places where they could go, they have, um, they have institutions behind them, they have individuals who are supporting them in such a way that they don't have to make those decisions. And the city did a great job with that, right? They set up pods, learning pods uh, for students um, to, to access, right? But there are still uh, a, a certain, there are still students within the system that missed out on those opportunities. So a huge um, undertaking that I believe that we'll see and that I think that we, we saw and will continue to see coming out of this pandemic in, in certain areas um, is this idea not only around the academics and curriculum um, for students, but around this idea of their uh, social, emotional, and their, uh, for lack of a better term, their maturity levels, right? You know, we're seeing students that are, that are coming out of this pandemic um, going into the sixth grade who are still operating as fourth graders, right? We're seeing students who are coming out of this pandemic or going into the 10th grade who are still operating as seventh graders, right? And so I believe we'll have to do 
um, some have some increased attention in those particular areas to help our students um, not only move forward academically, but move forward emotionally, move forward socially, uh, move forward cognitively as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Councilman Bill Bestpitch, next question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ryan, it's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, what role and relationship should a trustee on the school board develop and maintain with the members of city council? How do you great, see those two working together? Great question, great question. So I, I'm a person, uh, I have a lot of mentors in my life who uh, have uh, rung home true to me that relationships are everything, right? Um, and so uh, I think the relationship between, the trust, between a trustee and council has to be one of transparency, has to be one of honesty, has to be one of accountability, has to be one in which um, there is a mutual level of trust in that particular relationship, right? Um, while, yes, it is uh, the school board's um, responsibility to set vision for the district, right, to set measurables and deliverables for the school district, right, um, I, I don't think that that could be done separate and away from um, the uh, guidance or the input or the partnership of city council, right? And so that's how I see that, that, that relationship from a trustee and a city council member, right? Um, the school district is a piece of what the city is, right? And so within that, uh, we, in order for us to get that piece of what the city does correct, we have to have a great working relationship um, with city council, right? Um, and then, too, it's always great to have a, a great relationship with the people who give you money, too, right? You know, that also needs to always be uh, uh, put into context as well, right? And so I think that you guys, in order to ensure that you guys know um, the reasons behind why that money is important, the reasons behind uh, why what is already being done um, in regards to uh, the budget for the city of Roanoke in relationship to the school system, um, the reasons why those things are needed. And in order for you guys to um, have a full picture of what those things are, I think that you need a healthy working relationship with trustees, and trustees need a healthy working relationship with council. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. All right. We'll now go to my left, and I'll ask Ms. Moon Reynolds to give you the next question. Hi, Ryan. Hey, how you doing? Welcome. My question is twofold. What do you perceive to be the major weaknesses and major strengths of the Roanoke City school system? And also, what is your assessment of the school superintendent? Yes, two great questions. Um, I would say uh, the strengths of the school system um, currently, uh, I, I believe that the school system uh, is, is a school system, again, in the area of family and community engagement that is doing some great things um, to ensure that uh, students and parents have access to high quality education. Um, is doing some great things, even through the, we just mentioned the pandemic, um, the ability for our school system to rally to ensure that our, our students were still fed um, and still taken care of in that regard um, is amazing. I even think some of the safety uh, protocols and safety measurements that have been undertaken by the school district uh, currently up to date, um, uh, even though there's more that could be done, they, th those are great safety measurements that have been in place, right? Um, even volunteering, I, I, I volunteer at some of the schools here and uh, in order to get into the school, even though I'm a face, a familiar face within the schools, right, I still have to go through the protocols in order to be admitted into a school building. And so I would say one of our uh, major strengths right now is um, ensuring the safety uh, of our students who are within those buildings. Um, I would say an area that could use some attentional, uh, uh, intentional attention or some uh, uh, um, increased focus uh, around that area, uh, I think that the school system, again, is a microcosm of the city of Roanoke at large, right? And there's no, uh, it's no secret that Roanoke um, is one of the most segregated cities uh, in the nation of Roanoke, right? And I think that that bleeds over into our school system sometimes in regards to the amount of access uh, to resources um, for our students and for our parents, right? Which, which is why I think that um, uh, public-private partnerships or, or, or uh, public or partnerships with the school, dis school system, with local nonprofits, different things of that nature, is vitally important. It's why I highlight um, the Beacons Project at Lucy Addison uh, Middle School so much, because I think it's going to take um, organizations 
like a YMCA. It's going to take organizations such as, as those. It's going to take the school system being intentional and in reaching out to those organizations to begin to bring some of those resources into areas that otherwise may not see them. And so I would say that a, 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 a weakness, uh, for lack of a better term, of the, of the district right now, or an area that, that we could begin to focus a little more on, is how do we increase access to resources um, across all schools uh, within our district. Um, and then to the second part of your question, my assessment of Superintendent White, um, I think that uh, to this point, she's one, she's a newcomer to Roanoke, right? And so anytime that you're a new face to a new area and you have to meet um, a whole bunch of new people, right? That is a tricky situation to navigate a lot of times. And so uh, my assessment of her uh, to this point is one that I think that she has done what she has needed to do in order to guide the district through a pandemic. I think she has done what she has needed to do in order to begin to bridge some of those gaps um, and be available to parents, be available to students, be available to faculty and staff um, within the school system. Um, and I, I believe uh, within the new strategic plan set for the district in areas of increasing uh, vocational opportunities, right? You know, I, as I mentioned to you guys earlier, being a graduate of William Ruffner Middle School, I was heartbroken when the school closed. And so to see that there are plans to revitalize um, William Ruffner Middle School in, a, in an area that I think, as I spoke to increasing the access of resources, where we had Rotec, which was doing, uh, which it was doing and is doing amazing things, but to now be able to take those resources to another area of Roanoke and do that through the school system, um, I think is, is, is an area that uh, um, is vitally important. And so my assessment of, of Superintendent White up until this point is I think that um, she has done a great job, especially uh, guiding us through this pandemic and uh, putting us in a position to increase the amount of access um, and resources to students all across the district. All right, uh, Councilwoman Vivian Sanchez Jones. Good morning. Good morning. My question has three parts, so I'll try to go slowly, so <laughs> you'll get it. <laughs> Describe your knowledge of the city's cultural and linguistic diversity and discuss the importance of the following providing services for students who are developing proficiency in English, offering opportunities for students to learn a foreign language. And lastly, ensuring that students from all neighborhoods have equitable access to high quality instruction and programs. Yeah, uh, three great questions that I'm gonna try to remember all three of them as I, as I answer your question. I may ask you to repeat um, a part of it sure. if I could. Um, so first, uh, the first part of your question, my knowledge of uh, how diverse of a city Roanoke is, right? Um, Roanoke, I believe, is one of the most diverse cities that we have in the Commonwealth of Virginia, right? Um, and that is a beautiful thing, right? When, when I'm out uh, amongst the city and within the, uh, our local schools, uh, I have the opportunity to see um, the diversity of Roanoke, to see um, how beautifully uh, Roanoke is coming together and Roanoke is growing as a city um, in regards to uh, diversity, right? Now, there's, within diversity, there's this, uh, the next term within that is equity, right? How do we ensure um, that all of our diverse populations of Roanoke, all of our students who um, English is a second, second uh, English is a second language to them, right? How do we ensure that we are um, uh, um, making available the opportunities to increase the amount of resources they have? And I, I, again, I, I focus a lot on parents, and I think that in order for us to to assist our students in increasing the amount of access they have to these opportunities, right? Um, I think we have to do that first and foremost for their parents, right? And so I think that we have to find ways to uh, increase our, our adult education, to uh, uh, make more robust our adult education opportunities, right? In those particular areas, again, in the areas of finance, financial literacy, in the areas of um, 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 home ownership, different things of that nature, right? How do we increase the opportunity um, for our parents to put themselves in a better position to then assist their children because as a school district, um, the school district sees a lot of the issues that, the, that, that come from the communities or that come from the house, right? Um, and a lot of times it, it falls on the school district's shoulders um, to find the solutions for those opportunities, right? Whether that is right or whether that is wrong, right? Um, that's a conversation that we could have at a later date. But I believe um, to, to your three questions, the key to that is to ensuring 
that are students who come from those diverse backgrounds, that their parents are put in a position that they now have the opportunity and the resources to invest in their children's education. Um, I'll give you a quick uh, uh, data point in a story to finish off answering this particular question. Uh, I went to a conference uh, that was uh, on the area of homelessness a few years ago here in the city of Roanoke. And uh, a lady from Virginia Tech um, shared with us that you were only supposed to spend somewhere around 30% of your annual income on your housing, right? And so they did a particular study with, they took some families who were spending somewhere around 50% of their annual income on housing and put them in position um, to decrease what they were spending from 50% to 30%. And what they saw with it, as, as soon as they were able to do that, what did those parents do with the additional money that was now coming into the households? They put that back into the educational lives of their children, right? So they took those resources that they were now able to uh, put back into their households and immediately invested that in their children. If we do that for our, our parents from our diverse populations and do that through the school system, right, using the school system as a tool for the city in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I believe we will increase the access to those edu educational opportunities for our students. All right. Uh, that concludes all of our questions, Mr. Bell. Now you have a couple of minutes just to close up and just share with us anything that you think we need to know or any questions. Yeah, uh, the last thing I want to share with you guys is that um, I think that Roanoke is a uh, great place. I think that Roanoke is a beautiful place that is growing, a place that uh, I'm proud to say um, is committed to finding solutions, is committed to um, ensuring that we are uh, putting uh, families and putting our residents in the best positions possible um, to succeed. Um, and so I am uh, extremely excited uh, at the opportunity to be one of those individuals uh, in a different respect um, to, to help ensure that our city is moving along in that direction. Um, and I have some personal investment in this, right? I have four children, one of them who is currently a Roanoke City Public School student as well, right? And so I have some personal investment ensuring that uh, our school system um, is um, continuing to move in the great direction that it currently is now. Um, and thank you guys so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Are right, everybody ready? We're just going to keep rolling. Anybody need a break? I'll just look out of the All right. We do. <laughs> We're going to keep rolling. Okay. We have to go ahead. Take a break.
thank you for coming out and putting your name up uh, for this process. And we're going to have each council member will have a question for you. Okay. But before we get started, we want to take two minutes in the beginning to let you introduce yourself to us. Uh, many of us know you, but still, uh, we'd like for you to introduce yourself and tell us uh, anything you think we need to know or why you are going to run on the okay. school board. And in the end, we'll give you an opportunity to close up. Okay, end. wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy Cohen. I am the rabbi at Temple Emanuel. Um, I have uh, been the rabbi there for 26, going on 27 years, and have uh, lived in Roanoke that long. Um, I uh, submitted my application for school board because I am really very passionate about what we can do for our children in our wonderful city and how we can change both their present and our future uh, to make our city uh, even better than it already is. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'll start off with the first question, and it's centered around security and public safety. Uh, guns are inundated in our community. Uh, guns seem to be making a comeback, sadly to say, in our schools, by appearing in our schools. There's going to be a summit, I think, to uh, Wednesday night regarding firearms, and a lot of people mm -hmm. will, will convene and discuss them. As a school board member, and many times the question I will get from parents, and I will refer them to school board members, is what can we do to stop guns from entering our schools? So I pose that question to you as a member. Ah, thank you. Um, I, I think it's an excellent question. I think that uh, safety and, and the issues of school violence, particularly since the Columbine shooting, have been on all of our minds. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, I'm not quite sure which I live and work in an environment where safety has been paramount to us for the 20 years since we created a preschool and have 70 children in a building that is often a target. Um, and I think that we need to look at this problem on several different levels. Number one is the most immediate level. How do we stop guns from getting into the school? Um, and not only getting into the school, but possibly being around the school. Um, so I know that, you know, there is a lot of discussion about metal detectors. We have had that discussion in our building as well. Uh, I think that there may be a place in some areas for metal detectors, but I think my understanding is that they don't really solve the problem. They may slow it down. Um, they create a bottleneck. They also create an issue uh, where children psychologically may not feel as safe. Um, additionally, guns can come in through windows. Uh, my understanding, having worked at great length with the police in our own building, is that when somebody wants to get a gun in a building, it's very, very difficult to stop that from happening. Um, there is the possibility of printing plastic guns, which won't be caught by metal detectors, which is an additional issue. So given all of those issues, um, I think number one, um, the most important thing I think that we can do is to train our students from a very young age about what it means to protect each other, about when you talk about something that you know, and about the idea that um, it is not quote unquote tattling or that sort of thing, but you are protecting the life of another person when you come forward with information that can help. Uh, I think that we also need to start at young age, which 
prevention. Uh, I would like to see us have significantly more uh, mental health teaching and mental health availability in our schools. I would like us to really be on top of children who we know are at risk for violence um, and to be helping them along the way so that this is not a choice that they make. Uh, I would like us to be talking about conflict resolution um, from young ages and, and all the way through being a uh, senior in high school and, and even beyond. Uh, I would also like to see us training our teachers and having our teachers, every teacher, go through safety training. Uh, I'd like to see our teachers possibly uh, have panic buttons. Um, we actually have those throughout our entire building. Every one of our preschool teachers has a panic button on them. I have a panic button on me at all times when I am in my building. Um, and we test them with the Roanoke City Police and we have an average response time of one minute and 30 seconds. Um, that's pretty good. And uh, so I think that there is a lot that we can do, but I think we also need to be somewhat realistic that we live in a society where violence is increasing across the board. We saw this in Pittsburgh and in South Carolina just this weekend. And that um, no matter how much we try to do, we may still be in a position where we are going to have to be on the reactive end as opposed to the proactive end of this problem. Um, but we should do everything in our power to proactively protect our children and our teachers. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll start on my left this time uh, with Councilwoman Moon Reynolds. How are you, Rath? I can't. I'm wonderful, thank you. Thank you for coming. My question is twofold. What do you perceive to be the major weaknesses, <clears throat> excuse me, and major strengths of the Roanoke City school system? And also, what is your assessment of the uh, school superintendent? Okay. Um, so, major weaknesses, I think I would need to uh, be a little bit more read in. I do think that in reaction to the pandemic, uh, we do, uh, we, we've lost almost two full years of education for many of our students, particularly our students who are most at risk, uh, who had trouble getting on uh, virtual learning, um, whose parents are working two or three jobs and didn't have the support at home. So I think we have a lot to make up educationally uh, from the pandemic. Uh, I am also, and this is a, a much wider city problem, uh, our schools are highly segregated. And I don't think that that is in anyone's best interest. Uh, my older daughter went to Roanoke City Schools. She chose to go to Ruffner um, for several reasons, but one of the reasons that we really pushed her to go to Ruffner was that we wanted her to be in the world with people of all kinds. Um, and that's very difficult uh, in the manner that we have our neighborhoods set up, which sets up our cities. And so I. I think that um, the amount of segregation in our schools is probably one of our biggest problems. Um, in terms of strength, I think that we have a city that is all about our children. We are all about doing amazing things for our children. I love the fact that there is a 40% off the top tax budget for our schools so that there's no political wrangling over how much money gets to the schools. I think that's very, very positive. Um, I think our schools are relatively well funded. They have great vision. Um, I had the honor of being on uh, the 2030, uh, it's not really long term, I guess it's kind of short term, an eight year plan. Uh, committee to help formulate that and I was so impressed with the administrators and with the teachers who were on those committees 
and how they thought about the children. And so I, I, I really do believe that we are in position uh, to have one of the finest urban school settings uh, that could be found in the United States. We're just coming out of the pandemic and I, and I think that that's a little difficult. Um, and in terms of Ms. White, I you know, will be very honest, some of you know she is my next door neighbor. Um, we have not spent a lot of time uh, talking about Roanoke City Schools. Uh, we do walk our dogs. Uh, but I think as a human being, she is a, a lovely human being. And um, coming into this job as the pandemic started, I cannot imagine a more difficult time uh, for any human being to become a superintendent in a school. And I think that she has done a, a phenomenal job. Um, and I look forward uh, to seeing what she can do as the pandemic wanes um, and as we uh, move forward with the challenges of raising uh, our students' academic um, and socio-emotional learning from this point forward. Does that conclude? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next question will be from Council Member Vivian Sanchez Jones. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my question is going to have three parts. And if I go too fast, please stop me. <laughs> Describe your knowledge of the city's cultural, linguistic diversity and discuss the importance of the following providing services for students who are developing proficiency in English, offering opportunities for students to learn a foreign language, and ensuring that, that students from all neighborhoods have equitable access to high quality instruction and programs. Thank you, excellent question. Uh, I know that approximately 15% uh, of the students in the Roanoke City Schools uh, come from Spanish speaking homes. Uh, or a uh, Hispanic background. Uh, there are also students in our schools uh, that speak a variety of different languages at home. Vietnamese, I believe, is the second uh, most spoken language at home. Um, I think it is absolutely essential that from the youngest age, uh, we offer uh, these children every possibility um, of becoming fluent in English, which I know they will because they're children and they absorb so much more beautifully than we adults do. Um, and that uh, the schools um, need to not only worry about language. Um, language is only one aspect, but I think culture is very important too. And, and that's actually one of the things that, that I wanted uh, to speak to you all about very much. Uh, we speak a lot about equity. Um, we speak a little bit less about diversity. And I think that they're both very equally important. Uh, in our city, we have over 110 or 120 different uh, nations represented. Our children represent over a hundred, I understand, of those nations. And they come to us with different cultures and different cultural norms. And not all children who are English as second learners come with the same cultural norms. Some of those children are going to have parents who are relatively, if not completely, fluent in English. And some will have parents who don't know any English at all. Some will come from situations where uh, they've moved here and an American lifestyle is very easy to adapt to and some will come from situations where, where that is very, very unusual. Um, I was working with a, a young man at Westside Elementary School last year and uh, there was a beeping in the background. And I kept saying to him, Emilio, what's going on in the background? And he said, I don't know, we live in a beepy house. Well, they had moved here from Guatemala. They had no idea what a smoke alarm was and that the battery in the smoke alarm was no longer working. Uh, that it was just something that was completely foreign to them. And so we talked about it, 
got a battery for them. They put it in, um, and it was so lovely. The mother comes over to the computer screen because it's in the midst of COVID, and she says, I'm going to give you a hug, and she hugs the computer screen because the beeping stopped. Um, but to me, those little things, the culture that our children come to school with is rich, it is wonderful, it should be shared, but we also need to make sure that they have the advantages of knowing uh, what to do when they run into something of that sort. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that, that we need to invest in English as a second language. I also think that we need to really be um, very aware of cultural diversity. Now, your second question, since I answered that one, I completely forget. Okay, it will be offering opportunities for students to learn a, fo a foreign language. Yes, yeah. And uh, so my understanding is that uh, the best time to learn a foreign language is before the age of eight. Um, I actually, I uh, speak Hebrew fluently, and we actually raised our <coughs> oldest child uh, with Hebrew as her first language. Um, and to this day, she's 31 years old, she can speak Hebrew fluently. Things got difficult with the second and third child. Um, they were raised with English as their main language, and maybe they know a third of what she knows being given instruction after the age of eight. Uh, so I would like to see us starting in kindergarten, uh, having the opportunity for children to learn spoken language. Um, and then probably starting in fourth, fifth, or sixth grade, um, and I don't really know quite honestly what the appropriate age is. I would have to turn to an educator for that to start reading in that foreign language. Um, but, uh, you know, foreign languages, again, are not just about words. They are about culture. And when you read in a foreign language, you tend to understand another culture which makes your life all the richer. And for the last part, I will repeat it. Ensuring Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Ensuring students from all neighborhood have e equitable access to high quality instruction yeah. and programs. Uh, so equity, I think, is one of our primary focuses and, and must be. Um, I know it is a primary focus of the 2030 plan of Roanoke City Schools. It is a primary focus of Roanoke City Council. I am honored to be on the Equity and Empowerment Advisory Board uh, with the Vice Mayor. And um, I think that there is no question that uh, we need to take every child where they are at and to make sure that we can do everything within our power to allow them to have the best education and the best opportunity to become the person they want to be and to fulfill their own potential um, as they move through our school systems and ultimately graduate from Roanoke City Public Schools. Thank you. Does that conclude your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, now we'll go right down the line here, uh, beginning with uh, Vice Mayor Trish White Bull. Good afternoon, Rybat. Good afternoon. We're at 12 o'clock now. <laughs> the morning has gone by. Um, my question is um, relatively simple. I just want you to identify two essential objectives that you hope to accomplish as a school board trustee. Thank you. Um, number one, um, is that I would like to increase equity across the board. Um, and equity not only in terms of uh, socioeconomic equity, uh, but uh, equity also in terms of um, children who come to us with various different kinds of disabilities, uh, children who come to us uh, maybe from a, a very socioeconomically strong home, but who need extra help in different types of instruction. Um, I would like to see us make sure that all of our buildings 
um, provide equity for any children that are handicapped. Um, I will share with you that my oldest child, who went to Patrick Henry for a while, uh, before Patrick Henry was rebuilt, we had to remove her from Patrick Henry. She has a uh, autoimmune disorder, which at the time uh, caused her joints to fall out of uh, their joint. I was not really very uh, well said, but you got the idea. And uh, she could not walk across the campus. It was just too painful. And the campus was built in such a way that when, uh, you know, a thousand plus students all get out at the same time, you can't really use a walker or a wheelchair to get across campus either. Um, and so we ultimately ended up taking her out of Patrick Henry and putting her at Community High School because it was a two room campus and she could easily move around. Uh, now, Patrick Henry has been rebuilt, so that would no longer be an issue. But I think we need to look at each and every one of our 24 schools and say, what are our issues here in terms of physical plant and equity? Um, I also uh, think that secondarily, uh, we need to think very, very seriously, and this gets back to Mayor Lee's question, about how we are going to ensure the safety of our children and of our teachers. And if you don't mind, Vice Mayor, I'd like to add a third. Um, as a rabbi, Please. we never do things in twos. <laughs> Please. And the third would be um, how we retain and attract uh, the uh, best teachers and staff to ensure a low student teacher population so that we can do all of these other things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, Council Member Joe Carr. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, at, as you alluded to a little bit earlier in one of your responses, uh, there we all face some challenges uh, during COVID-19. Uh, please identify for us a gap that you became aware of um, in our educational system during COVID-19 and a way that you would work to address that. Uh, so, you know, unquestionably, our children have had an educational gap. I think that uh, from my point of view, that gap actually affects our youngest children the most. Uh, children up until third grade learn to read in order to learn to read. Children fourth grade and above read for knowledge. And when you enter the third grade and you miss two years basically of school, and you're basically on a first or 1.5 reading level, you're not ready to begin to read for knowledge. And that puts you behind uh, for many, many years. So um, I think that uh, first, first and foremost, we need, if we have limited resources, which we always do, uh, we need to look at those youngest children. We need to work very, very hard to get their reading levels to the point where they are capable of reading for knowledge before they enter fourth grade. Um, if they're already in fourth or fifth grade, um, then, you know, we need to, to look at uh, the possibility of rearranging what is most important. Um, I am not a great fan of SOLs. Um, I think that um, particularly in elementary school, um, children most need to love learning, and then they need to be able to read, to be able to do math, and to be able to write. Um, I don't know that they need to be able to memorize facts about Virginia history. Um, that should come later. Um, and so I would, and you know, again, it's a question of statewide because of SOLs and that kind of thing. Uh, but I would take more and more time from their day um, to really work on basic skills. Thank you. Uh, 
now Councilman Bill Bestpitch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good to see you, Rabbi. Thank you. Always. What role and relationship should a trustee develop and maintain with City Council? Uh, I think it should be very, very close. Um, first of all, I'm close to most of you anyway. <laughs> but secondly, um, you know, our schools are a flagship of what our city is about. And if we do not all work together collaboratively, um, then we are not doing what is in the best interest of our city. And um, I am a big believer in collaboration. And uh, so, um, you know, I would expect that the city council would want to meet with the school board. I would expect that the school board would want to meet with the city council. I would expect that we would bring concerns to one another um, and that we would all work together towards a common solution. Uh, so um, I would look forward to that collaboration and I think it would be in the best interest of both the city and the schools. Thank you. Right, th thank you, Rabbi. That concludes all of our questions. Now I got about two minutes that I'm going to give you to wrap it up, conclude, or maybe say some things that you want to get out that we didn't ask you about, and uh, and if you have any questions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to to suggest to you all, um, our school board has really been very good in terms of its diversity. But the area in which it has not been diverse, and has not been diverse, quite honestly, I think since I've lived here, is in terms of religious diversity. And we have significant religious diversity within Roanoke City Schools. Um, I work very, very closely with Dr. Salim Ahmed. Um, we are on many, many panels together um, to talk about diversity in schools to talk about the idea that um, we need to, to look at our schools not only um, from racial diversity, but also from the issue of religious and cultural diversity. And I think that I have the background and that I make a very strong candidate in that regard. Um, and I hope that, that you would consider that because I think it really is very, very important. Um, additionally, uh, you know, I just wanted to say to you that um, should you decide that two of the other candidates are stronger, I want you to know that I will continue to support Roanoke City Schools. They are phenomenal. I will do whatever I can to ensure the success of our students. Um, I will, with great joy, continue to run the Lincoln Terrace Elementary School Reading Buddies program um, and, and do what I can to, to make sure that the students in our city leave here with the best education that uh, we can possibly offer them. And um, I, I also wanted to let you know that I appreciate that given uh, some of the controversy over whether or not a school board position should be elected or appointed, that I fall firmly into the appointed realm. And I fall there for two reasons. Number one, I think you lose talent when it is an elected position. There are very good people who just do not want to run for election and you would lose that talent. Number two, uh, by, by being appointed, uh, we avoid what we have seen in many areas around us where school board, which is not supposed to be political, becomes highly political. And um, I think it is a wonderful thing in Roanoke City that we have avoided those issues. So. Thank you for standing firm on that, and uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. What?
we got the one final applicant, and that's Joyce Watkins. I'm assuming she's out there. Good afternoon, Joyce, and uh, welcome. We're running behind, but that's, that's, that's our fault. Uh, but thank you for putting yourself forward to for reappointment. You re reappointment. <laughs> yes, sir. You've been through it. What term is this for you? What is it? I'm ending my first term. You're ending your first term. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to grab something if it's okay. Do I need to wear the mask the whole time? Yeah, whatever you feel comfortable with. I'll take it off. Sorry, I needed that. I feel more comfortable right. without it when I'm speaking, if that's okay. <laughs> thank well, you. Thank you. We're going to do, everyone here will have a question for you. And we'll go back and forth down the line. Okay. And, uh, but prior to that, we want you to take two minutes and just introduce yourself to us again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll go right, proceed right into the questions. Yes, sir. All Thank right. you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joyce Watkins. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I am uh, ending my first term with the Roanoke City School Board as a trustee. And it has been um, an amazing ride. <laughs> We've had so much going on. Um, and I'm sure you'll ask me some questions about it or around it. And I'll illustrate as we go through the interview. My day job, I am a manager at Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, we have been working remotely because of the pandemic for the last two years. And that has been a challenge because I am a people person. <laughs> so. Um, uh, we plan to go back into the building, so I'm pretty excited about being back downtown. Really excited about our new um, uh, administrative offices over here near you guys, so I'll be coming through here quite often. Um, but I stand before you today to petition to extend my uh, service to the Roanoke City's public schools. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll get started. I have the first question. Yes, sir. Uh, and this is a question centered around security and safety. Uh, plus, I, I know you understand that we got a big summit coming up that's mm -hmm. going to be focused on that. Uh, I'm assuming, I think it's Wednesday of this mm -hmm. week. That's right. Uh, gun gun violence, but not, not necessarily in the, in the community. But I want you to talk about in schools, guns in schools, uh, what thoughts or ideas you have uh, to respond to the question that I get so often from parents is how do we know uh, or how do we prevent guns from coming into our schools? So could you respond to that question? Absolutely. That's a very good question. I think that as a community, I think it takes all of us. It's not a school issue, I think it's a community issue. The kit, the guns that come into the school, you know, come in from the outside. And so I think the, the programs that we offer in the school system, I think that, you know, the support that we offer our students is helpful. I think the support that we help, um, we have for the parents helps as well. But I think as a community, even in businesses, I think that we all have a responsibility to try to do our part in ensuring that guns don't get into the hands of students. Students are in school to be educated. Um, there's, there's no place in the school system for guns. Um, there has been you know, talk of you know, why don't we have um, 
metal detectors everywhere in the school system. Well, then there's other things that come along with that. That's not a bad idea, except that who's going to man them? Who's going to, how are you going to manage the bottleneck that you have? And what are you going to do with the shortage of, you know, um, police officers that you have to, to mitigate the circumstances if there is a gun found? Um, so there are a lot of things that go along with that. But I think that if we all put our heads together as, as in this summit and we talk about it, I think that we'll come up with the, with, the, with the right way to move forward for our students and for their families and for our community as a whole. Let me ask you, did I hear you say you all had metal detectors or you? No, no, no. I said, I, I said the question has been asked, why don't we use metal right. detectors all the time? We use them when we have um, situations that we know could could go left, um, rival um, sports events where we know there'll be there could be some issues, or if you know word has gotten to the school that something's going on in the community that could come into the schools, um, then my understanding from Mrs. White is that we rent those; we don't own them, so we don't we haven't purchased them um, mm -hmm. for our schools. That's another thing, the expense of them. And how many schools are you gonna put them in? All of them? Because now we have, you know, middle schoolers, you know, it's not high school, it's it's middle school, and how long before it goes to the elementary schools? So we have to put our heads together and we have to find the answer. And I think that um, city council uh, with under Mr. Cobb's leadership um, is doing a great job at rooting out, you know, what can we do uh, what can what what do the kids want? What do they want to, to have instead of you know? Um, what what would help them? Is it jobs? Is it entertainment? Is it things to do in the city that would deter them from going in that direction? I think that's you know that's wonderful, and I think that you know in us at the school system hiring you know someone who is a um, expert in those in that area of um, mitigating you know gang violence and, and things like that and partnering with you know the city uh, employees and trying to make sure that we head it off at the pass I think that the more we talk the more information that we have the more that we can deal with it ahead of time okay well, I just wanted to follow up on that because mm -hmm. you're an incumbent you've been there I have and right now you all have policies in place and that's gonna be a, we do. a question that's not gonna go away Oh, it's not. Uh, it's not going to go away, so I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on it as you head into. Uh, and we do have zero tolerance for guns in school, any type of weapons in school. So, and we uphold that. You know, we have hearings. I, I had the unfortunate pleasure, I guess, of sitting in on one of the hearings, my very first one recently. Okay. And, it, you know, it, it's, it's gut-wrenching that you have to think about a young person's future and how the decisions that they make and the, okay. our reaction to it is going to impact their future. But they made that decision themselves. Okay. Now I forgot which way I'm going. I'm going to go, to go this way. I'll start with uh, Vice Mayor Tish White Board. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Ms. Wong. Okay. Oh, actually, it's afternoon. Go. Good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, we're going back and forth morning and afternoon well good afternoon um my question is relatively simple yes um i just want you to identify two essential objectives that you hope to accomplish as a school board trustee that you haven't already done or something new that you think might might be a a, a good asset to add um the reason, one of the reasons why I petitioned to remain on the school board is because we are coming up on um, some things for our city that I think are going to make a huge impact. So when we think about bringing our um, career and technical um, courses over to northwest side of town, I, I'm on, I serve on that committee. And that is important to me um, vice mayor because you know not every student is meant for college and so I, I feel that if we're expanding the um, opportunities for students to have workplace readiness I want to be front and center and on top of that I made that very clear in all of my meetings how important CTE is to me 
because you know we have to make sure that our community thrives. So for me, one is making sure that I'm keeping on top of the CTE program and making sure that it flourishes with expand with the expansion. The other is I want to make sure that the Center for Empowerment is truly going to be everything that we um, envision it to be, the type of services that we have that we will offer for students, for their families, for people all over the community, um, refugees, you name it. There, there should be something in that empowerment center that serves every, every area of our community. So making sure that I'm involved and asking the hard questions um, on those two things is important. And I know that, you know, they're in the works now, so there's, they, they are, to answer your question, they are things that have, haven't been done, um, but just making sure that we're giving it the proper governance and making sure that it moves the way that it should is so vital to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, uh, Councilman Joe Carr. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good to afternoon. see you. Good to see, <laughs> Good to see you. you too, sir. Well, you know firsthand that um, when it came to, to readiness um, during COVID, we, we faced some challenges. And I think the school system did respond quickly and efficiently in many ways. Talk with us about a gap that you saw emerge uh, in the educational system during COVID and how you would continue to address that going forward. One of the gaps that I saw prior to COVID that really showed itself during COVID was um, the fact that some of our schools are overpopulated. Um, we have to make sure, and, and we have in our um, strategic plan, we, we have uh, plans, and thank you, Council, for the appropriations that you make available to us for us to run um, the division. But we have plans in place to make sure that schools, um, that the student-teacher ratio and that schools are not busting open at the seams. Um, it's gonna take us some time to do that, of course, because we have other capital improvement plans in place and we, you know, making sure that DE and I is we interwoven all through every decision that we make. Um, but I think the, the crowdedness of some of the schools, and, and that's no one's fault. Communities grow, and we want our city to grow. But they were growing, as we can see, it's growing in certain areas where there's not enough, um, there, there's just not enough school to hold it all. And so we, we, that was something that I was questioning um, before the pandemic, and that's something that I'm keeping a watchful eye on as we move forward. Because, you know, I don't, I don't think that this is over, and I think that as we, you know, go forward, if, if something like this happens again, we've got to continue to have asynchronous learning or some version of online learning, um, as well as we've got to make sure that where we can, we can social distance our kids, and we can't do that if the school is overpopulated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Councilman Bill Bestbitch has the next question. Yes, sir. Thank Hello. you, Mr. Mayor. Hello, Joyce. Always so good to see you. You too. <laughs> what role and relationship should a trustee develop and maintain with city council? I think that a school board trustee and city council should have a trusting and a collaborative relationship. Um, I value um, the time that I spend with my board buddy because not only do I um, get to share, we both get to share information, but it's a, um, it's a, it's, it's a relationship of mutual respect. Um, and it's the same type of relationship that, you know, we have or I have with, the board has with Ms. White. It's not one of a, a boss and a management relationship. It's more of a collaborative, let's get things done for the good of the students relationship and for the good of our community. So I know that there's governance, but you manage, you know, the work, you evaluate the work, you govern it, you govern the, the board as 
as you all, as we govern the district, you all govern the board to make sure that there's the checks and balances. But that trust and mutual trust and collaboration is so important and the communication piece of it. Well, I think, you know, I'm finishing up 16 years on Roanoke City Council. And I want to thank you for being the best school board buddy I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, too. <laughs> and thank you are you, a Mayor. wonderful mentor as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, our next question will come from Council Member <coughs> Moon Reynolds. Hi, Joyce. Hey. How are you? Good afternoon. Thank Good. you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question is twofold. Sure. What do you perceive to be the major weaknesses and major strengths of the Roanoke City school system? And also, what is your assessment of the school superintendent? Okay. So weakness. I think we had a weakness in that our community and our um, students and our staff didn't trust us. I think that we are on our way. One of the, two of the things that were important to me when I started my first term, or when I was even thinking about being a, a school board trustee was transparency and trust and communication um, between us and our community and our students and our staff. So we did a lot of um, town halls with staff, students, and the community when I first got on the board. It was there was a lot of chaos. <laughs> there was a lot of chaos. Um, but we are on our way. The, the, I think that everyone through the communication that we now give, the transparency, um, everything is, is out there. Our strategic plan is laid out. Anyone can follow um, what we're doing and what the plan is and where we are in, in that plan. Um, so that's the strength is that we have a path forward. It's written, it's documented, and it's governed appropriately. And then what is my assessment of Mrs. White? How are your strengths, do you have? Are you, you're calling that your strength? Our strategic strength plan strategic and our collaborative, okay. the way that our board works together and governs appropriately, okay. and our strategic plan. And I can get you copies if you don't have a copy of it, but this do, yes. tells you everything. Yeah. All of our plans, D and I is in, interwoven in every decision that we make, um, and it's it's clear and it's open. Okay. Um, the I'll share another weakness. Um, that's going to be, well, we're, we're seeing the evidence of the loss in learning. We have to catch up. We're working on it, but we have to catch up. And the honest. You know, to be quite honest, you know, some of the reporting that we've asked for in the last several years wasn't available before. So um, without the reporting, you didn't even know what you had, right? And so now, you know, with all the great reporting that Mrs. Wife's, you know, staff has accommodated us, they've afforded us everything that we've asked for. Um, we we're able to take a, a real good, hard look at everything, and that's how we came up with the roadmap map to success. And then my assessment of Mrs. White. So we wrote the, we came up with the questions, we, we wrote the questions, we pulled the desires of our staff, our students and the community and what they wanted the next superintendent to look like before we ever met Ms. White. And we spent a lot of time in boardrooms um, trying to pull all that information together with the help of a firm that we um, procured. And we had a lot of qualified candidates, but what stood out to me about Ms. White the most when we interviewed her is that she came in with Destination 2030. She had her first 100 days in a, a manual that looked like this for us to tell us what she was gonna do or what she wanted to promote her first 100 days. And within a short period of time, she had Destination 2030. She knew, you know, this is where I think you should go. And Ms. White, I feel, hasn't, um, she has not changed one bit. Sometimes when people interview, and I have a team of folks, so <laughs> I know about interviewing and, you know, hoping that you get what you see before you, right, when you're interviewing people. She is the real deal. She cares about the city and she cares about our students. She wants to make sure that 
um, we're doing the best that we can do. Um, do I blindly trust? No, absolutely. I'm on the board to ask the hard questions. <laughs> but, but, however, everything that I have, you know, we have asked of her, um, she has delivered. And so is her staff. Everybody is all in for our community. And that's what's most important. That's what makes our board work. And our division successful. All right, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Vivian Sanchez Jones has a question or follow. -up. Excuse me? I said, you got a question or do you have a follow up? Have um, a I have a follow up before I ask my question, if that's okay. Oh, you can ask that first and then come okay. back with your question. Hello. Hi. Um, what, do you, um, what do you think our graduation rate is going to look like in the next four years? Since we, you talked about the challenges with, um, I think uh, that we we'll, I think yeah. that we're working really hard to improve our graduation rate. What will it look like? It depends on the amount of work that the students are willing to give us back from the amount of work that our staff is putting mm -hmm. into it. We are giving everything that we have, throwing everything that we can at success for our students. We're hoping mm -hmm. that it improves you know, tremendously, but can we guarantee that? No, but we're gonna give everything we can to getting it up. We don't wanna give an unrealistic number. We want to take into account learning loss. We want to um, assess and assess and more assess. We, we, we do that often, this, you know, the students are assessed often. Um, we're also even looking back and talking to the students that have left to, you know, do, you know, exit interviews and following them for a few years to determine you know, were they successful, where did they go, how did they get there, and what was important to them while they were with us, what didn't they get that we need to give the next group. So we're working on it. I don't know what that percentage would be. Okay. Thank you. But an improvement, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that was the follow-up question. Okay. So now I have my... Of question. All right. Well, that concludes. Up. She no, no, no. She has another question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was. I didn't okay. understand yeah. you. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, my question has three parts. Okay. And please bear with me if I need to repeat any of it. I will be glad. I was gonna say, bear with me because yes. I'll answer no. one and maybe forget the next okay. two. <laughs> Describe your knowledge of the city's cultural and linguistic diversity and discuss the importance of the following: providing services for students who are developing proficiency in English, offering opportunities for students to learn a foreign language, and the last one is ensuring students from all neighborhoods have equitable access to high quality instruction and programs. And ask me, tell, tell me the first phrase you said again. Um, what, was the, what was the question at the beginning? Describe your knowledge of the city's cultural and linguistic diversity. Okay, so as I mentioned that Dee and I um, are woven through every decision that we make. So um, the city, Roanoke City Schools role and our role as the board is to make sure that everyone is met where they are and given what they need to be successful. Um, and that's any culture, every culture. We wanna make sure that everyone gets what they need. Our communications, um, our new um, con communications director, and I believe she just got a promotion. She is, um, I think she's done tremendous work in making sure that everything that's communicated out is not just in English, that it is communicated out in, um, in languages that you know, others need to be able to understand, you know, okay, here is what Running City Schools is saying. Our um, culture is, you know, is, is everyone. Um, Roanoke City is, you know, we wanna make sure that we're representing all the students and their families. And when it comes to our school system, no one should be left behind or not will get what they need because English may not be their first language or they have a, um, a disability or something of that nature. Everybody should absolutely get what they need based on our 
roadmap to success for all of our students, and that includes supporting their families. Ask me. Okay. <laughs> You're like, she didn't give, it every, give me everything I wanted. Yeah. Um, providing services for students who are developing proficiency in English. Mm -hmm. And we do. Um, I mean, again, with our diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're making sure that we are providing those services to students. Now, I'm sure that the city has other services as well for their families, but um, Haley Poland and her team make sure that all of our students are getting everything that they need. Okay. How about offering opportunity for students to learn a foreign language in all Roanoke City schools? Say it again. Uh, the opportunities for all students in Roanoke City to schools learn. to receive a foreign language. Um, I don't know if every grade level has that opportunity right now. Um, I would have to look it up. That is not something that, you know, I came prepared to answer. Okay. But um, I feel that as though throughout our students' education from K through 12, there is an opportunity for our students to learn a different language. Okay. I just can't tell you what grade level that is at this moment. Okay. And the last one was insurance students from all neighborhood have equitable, equitable access to high quality instruction and programs. Absolutely, that is, uh, that's number one. Students are number one. Um, as I, I believe I mentioned before, every decision that we make, every conversation that we have is based on all of our students. There is no one um, neighborhood that you know, a particular board member represents or anything like that. We are there for every student and making sure that they all get what they need in every you know, ward of our community, um, every language spoken, every, um, every need. Every need that our division can um, assist with, we have programs and support systems in place to try to get them what they need. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. If you find one that we don't have, let me know. <laughs> I will let you know. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, thank you, Joyce. That concludes all of our questions. Uh, now you have two minutes just to share with us anything that you want us to know that the questions didn't bring out or any questions you may have. I don't necessarily have a question, but I do have something that I'd like to share with you all that I promised <laughs> that I would share. I said it um, in a board meeting, and I said it privately, um, and I think you all should hear it. Um, when I was um, considering um, the first term, I wasn't sure where my thoughts were on appointed versus elected boards. But as I've worked on the school board for these last three years, I just want to thank you all for your, um, your intuition, for um, your forward thinking in putting the right people together. The folks that I have, um, some have left the board now. We're going to have you know, new people coming on. I, you know, if I get the opportunity to come back, I'll be working with you know, additional new people. But just the fact that you all, when you get together and you make your decision and you enter your whole process with um, forming our board, it's such important work and you've done an amazing job at it. That's the bottom line. You've done an amazing job at it. We are not groupthink, right? The board is not, we don't all think the same. We come from different backgrounds, cultures. But when we're in, our, in a room, we are making decisions very important decisions for our students, for our staff, and for our community. And no matter what our personal um, biases are, in, and everybody has them, collectively, we get that work done. And it's awesome to watch our board. It's almost surreal when you're, you, if you just kind of think about the work that's being done, you know, and the work that has been done over the last three years, it is awesome that this team and the, um, the folks who left last year, all of us have been able to 
get the work done. You know, when I came in, we had a retiring superintendent. We had um, issues in schools. All of the stuff was on TV. <laughs> and we had a pandemic. We had to get a new superintendent. Um, all these things. And we have been able to work collectively together along with Mrs. White's staff and do the governance work and get out of the way so that her folks can really do their job. And so the point that I'm making is the work that you guys do in selecting your board makes the system work. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I need a motion to go into closed meeting to discuss the selection of uh, the candidate to fill the term of office of former council member Robert L. Jeffrey ending December the 31st, 2022. <coughs> so I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. All right. Madam Clerk, you please call the roll. <coughs> Aye. Vice Mayor Whiteboy. Aye. Mr. Bespich. Aye. And Mayor Lee. Aye. And the motion passes. So council will be in recess for a closed meeting.